I told it to record. Well, I told it to record at a cloud. I don't know where it's going to put it. So I'll have to flash that down later. Six, six, five, six. Um, since uh, we are coming up here on a mighty fortress, is our on Reformation next week. I thought we would, you know, uh, it's it's coming up this weekend actually. So I thought we would uh, get ourselves ready to sing this, right? So, all right, so let's see. Now I've lost control over here again. Of course, I have. Well, technology what works. Well, it's just a pain. Okay. So,
So as we get started, um, we're on 61. And we're going to pick it up at verse 14. We kind of read this last time. And, uh, So, Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, lots and lots of different pieces here. We're told to bless. We're told to live in compassion. We're told to live in harmony. We're told, told to value others. We're told to do what is right. That, of course, is defined by God, right? We're told to be peaceful. We're told to trust God for justice to love our enemies, and ultimately that the way we engage the world is by doing good, right? So the world thinks you overcome evil by more evil, all right? And in some respects, if you have, you know, one nation attacking another nation and the way to repel that is to fight, right? So there is at least something there that it's like, well, yeah, under certain situations, we're forced to do it that way. But as God's people, we don't seek to win souls for Christ through warfare. All right? So as we, as we dig a little deeper here, First of all, any of these actions are going to flow from the spirit living within me. I don't have the capacity to generate this level of love and compassion and so forth. It can only come to me from God through Christ, and then I pass it on as the Holy Spirit leads me to. And so recognizing that, in one sense, it takes the pressure off of me because it's like, well, I don't actually... You know, I don't know if I can love my enemies if someone is treating me like an enemy. But God loves his enemies, and he will fill me with his love and show me how to do that, if that makes sense. So blessing persecutors, okay, is actually rescue mission. As a matter of fact, almost all of this is rescue mission. God is on a rescue mission. He's been on a rescue mission ever since Adam and Eve rebelled against him. And he continues to do that. Jesus says, I came and came to seek and save the lost. That is part of God's ongoing rescue mission, even though Jesus is now glorified, never to die again, and is our living Lord and Savior, he is still seeking and saving the lost. He is still on that mission, right? He chooses to do it through us for the most part. Um, although he, you know, does involve himself in that far more deeply than any of us do. Here is a perspective of eternity. What happens to the persecutor who dies without faith in Christ Jesus? What happens? Where are they going to end up? They're going to end up in hell, right? Might the Holy Spirit use our witness, our unexpected response, 
that cause a persecutor to become a Christian. It has been known to happen. How might the Holy Spirit use such a witness to influence others who observe what is happening? All right. Yeah, um, for years, uh, when I was at um, Trinity Crown Point, we would do a confirmation retreat. Um, we did it at different places. Originally, it was up here at Luther Haven and got to a point where the, the, the travel time and the expense just got a little too much. Um, and one of my colleagues who had taken that over as the lead on that had found a local camp that was like 10 minutes from church. Okay, it didn't have near the facilities of Luther, sadly. Um, <laughs> but there it is, right? And it, it, the, the curiosity is the one thing that that allowed us to do is we always would have a worship service on Saturday night. And so now we can invite parents and aunts and uncles and baptismal sponsors to come. And we wouldn't tell the kids they were going to be there, although after you do it the first couple of years, the word gets out. But you know, so they would come into this place, and here is their relatives with little candles. And anyway, that's not what led me down that path. What led me down that path is we used to play a game on Saturday night called Romans and Christian. Okay. And um, if you've ever been out at a camp at night and played like flashlight tag, you know what I'm talking about? People are around with flashlights, you know. Well, the rule was is Christians had no flashlights. The Romans had the flashlights. So you would release the Christians out to the camp, and the Romans, the evil guards, would have the flashlights, and if they spot the person and call them by the correct name, it was one of our little ways because we would use older kids, high school kids, to help run this thing. So it was one of the ways of getting high school kids to learn names of the new conference. Right? Because if you go, hey, I got you, uh, you keep going. It's like, Joe, it's like my name's not Joe, see ya. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and they had to know the right name. So ultimately, um, they would have a place where they would then you know, put them in jail, if you will. Um, and somewhere out there, usually, almost always, it was me with this guitar, just playing Christian songs softly. And if the Christians could find me, they were in sanctuary. So you understand the dynamics? So then after the round was over, you know, because it would be a timed piece, we'd come back and we'd talk about what happened. Well, I got captured. It's horrible. Um, you know, what well, did you witness to the guards? Huh? <laughs> you know, I made sanctuary. You know, the Romans were kind of buzzing around there looking to, to, to capture us, but we were safe. I said, did you witness to them? Huh? You know, <laughs> you, you follow what we're doing here, right? It was a whole situation of, hey, yes, it's a fun little game, but there's a serious intention. And ultimately, the people that Paul is writing to, all right, are undergoing persecution at some level. Certainly by the Jews, but the Romans by this point in time are into the act. Okay? Rome, before Rome became a world power, one of the Maccabeans, these are intertestamental Jewish leaders, okay, between the Testaments, um, had made a um, basically an alliance with Rome. Because the way the Maccabees stayed in power is they would ally one larger power against another larger power. I mean, they fought some of their own battles, too, but they did not have the wherewithal to do it all by themselves. So they would play one against the other. Kind of thing. And so when Rome actually conquered, as a result of that pre-existing agreement, they allowed the Jews to keep their temple and to worship in Jerusalem according to their laws, right? Where everywhere else in the Roman Empire, they established temples everywhere, okay? There would have been temples, like Caesarea would have had them. Um, there was a city, um, Sephora, 
You've probably not heard of that. It is south of Nazareth. It was a major Roman city that until archaeologists discovered the ruins of it, um, in recent times, nobody even knew it was there. It had just gone away, right? Um, but some beautiful mosaic work, they could tell that it was a, a fairly um, significant city and it was built on the Roman design. Okay, so it was not a Galilean city, even though it's in Galilee. It's built on a Roman plan. Um, there's at least one historian who happens to be a member of the LCMS. His name is Paul uh, Mayer, uh, son of the Lutheran hour speaker, Walter, or Meyer, Paul Meyer, son of Walter Meyer, um, and uh, PhD in history. Um, and his specialty was the first, was ancient history, but especially um, those early centuries of Christianity. Um, and he suspects that Jesus and Joseph may have been employed because that city would have been built during that era and they employed people from everywhere they could get to aid in the construction. Be that as it may, um, the issue is, is, is that um, the Romans had this covenant or pact with the Jews. And so when Christianity first arose, to a Roman, it was just Judaism. All right? Oh, it's just those Jews. Until it finally kind of became clear to them that, wait a minute, this isn't Judaism. And actually, the Jews don't like this thing. This is a foreign religion and therefore illegal. <laughs> and that's when the persecution of Christians began. Early Christians were all Jewish. Pentecost was a Jewish event, right? It was, it's not until Antioch that some of the Jews share with their Gentile neighbors the good news of Jesus, and Antioch becomes the first mixed Jewish Christian church. It would kind of like being the first black and white mixed Christian church, you know, in the 1950s, right? If you catch my drift. So recognize that when he's talking about persecution, some of it's coming from the Jews, especially against their own people who have, you know, adopted faith in Christ Jesus. But it's also now coming from the Roman government. And, and the persecution will kind of get worse and then, better, you know, not as bad and then worse and then not as bad. It was that that was kind of the nature of it. So ultimately, what he is saying is if you are blessing your persecutors, it's a rescue mission. This Christians are still persecuted all over the world today. I don't know if you're aware of that, but that's true. Okay. Um, and ultimately, we hear stories coming out of the persecuted church where their witness impacts persecution. Because God can use that not only to strengthen his church um, and individual Christians, but he can also use it as an opportunity to reach people who otherwise would not give Christianity the time of day. So, um, and it's, it's curious, because again, um, I'm aware of stories, especially out of places like China, where, believe it or not, the Bible is still being hand copied. Even though it's legal to print the Bible in China, the number of copies is very restricted. And who gets them is anybody guess, I think. Um, but curiously, there's an organization that for years has been shipping Bibles into China. And originally, people would smuggle it in, right? And I suppose even in this day and age, that would be much more dangerous than it would have been then. Then if they find you, they just kick you out of the country. Now, I don't know what they would do, to be honest. Um, but, but there was a point where they were shipping whole shipping containers up and over there because enough of the customs agents were curious about what this banned book was all about. And so they grabbed one and read it and became Christians and they could guide whole shipping containers through the process. 
At risk, mind you, yes, but it was rather incredible, you know. And then somehow Christians would have to show up and grab cases of these and disappear into the night, kind of a thing. Um, you know, it, it just, yeah, it, there was a point where it was a very extensive operation. And, um, you know, it, I think if that country ever actually turns, it's going to be the Christian church that currently lives underground that's going to do it. Right? And uh, you think of all the despair and destruction that has occurred uh, in COVID and all that kind of stuff. It's like, huh, I just wonder how much evangelism is going Right? There is some tiny little pieces of Western evangelism. If you know Camp Luther had Haven and Brenda Jane, their daughter Anna is over there right now at an English teaching school. Everybody on the staff is Christians. You cannot overtly teach Christianity or you're you're either under arrest or gone or you know some combination of both. The reality though is you can live it. And they do have little conversations and so forth. So some of that's still going on. And anyway, um, the idea here of connecting to others in compassion, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, right? Um, and ultimately, uh, pointing back again to the fact that this all comes from God, if you go to 2 Corinthians, Chapter one, starting at verse three, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trouble, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. God brings comfort into our lives so we can share it with others. And it's sometimes, according to this, which is a little more difficult, we experience distress so that we are better prepared to comfort someone else. All right? And ultimately, that's, I think... You know, in this one little passage here, this is one of the things that that Paul is talking about is God pours his comfort into my life. Not just for me. It is for me. It does help me. Not just for me. It's for me to share. Right? And to walk with other people. Um. So we're told to live in the peace um, that Christ brings in verse, you know, 16. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud and so forth. And if we take a look at Colossians chapter 3, there is a description here. And it, it's part of a longer description um, of what the Christian church looks like um, at its best. So starting at verse um, 14, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It says, members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. We're given that gift of peace so that we can share it with one another. And ultimately, in that process, we are um, recognizing 
that if I have a fellow brother or sister who's distressed or upset, I've been given that gift of peace to share. I can sort of, sort of meet them in their upset and invite them to experience that peace, right? And that comes out of that love that makes it all work. And, and you know, it's that sacrificial love of, of Jesus Christ that does that. Um, you know, ultimately, um, as we as we think about this, there's a phrase in verse 16, don't be conceited, okay, of Romans chapter 12. Um, and this is probably a familiar proverb to you, um, Proverbs 3, uh, starting at verse 5, starts with, um, you know, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. We've heard this one before. And lean not on to your own understanding. <laughs> in all your ways, acknowledge him, God, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there it is. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Right. Um, and ultimately, the, the verses after that kind of go on to talk about what that then brings into our lives. Right. Um, but this idea of, hey, I don't have all the answers. I, I may not have any answers in some situation. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to try and say, I need to figure this out. I'm going to say, Lord, I need your help to figure this out. And ultimately, that's going to keep me in, in, his, in his care. Um, 17 to 19 is kind of like, Ultimately, living in peace, not in evil. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Oh, my. You know, we've heard that one. But how human is that? Somebody hurt me, I'm going to hurt them back. Right? You know, um, it, it's almost like, you know, maybe we need to put this in letters like a foot high and some of our, uh, you know, places around our school, just to remind our school children. Um, <laughs> you know, that, hey, he did this. Well, what did you do? Well, but he did. Okay, let's slow down. Let's back up. What did you do? Right? And, and it's amazing how we get one part of the story, but not the other part of the story. Is that what you know how that works? Um, yeah, your kids never did that, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> mine all did. Um, <laughs> so we, we know how that works, right? So in Proverbs, we've got a we've got this a couple of statements in Proverbs um, that really uh, speak to this, if you will. Proverbs 20, 22. Um, if I can find it here. Do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord, and he will deliver you. Ah. Don't go down that road of payback. Because if we live in a world that's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we'll be living in a blind and toothless world, won't we? Mm -hmm. um, so Proverbs 24, 29, as we look at that one, again says, do not say, I'll do this to him as he has done to me. I'll pay that man back for what he did, right? What does Jesus do with that? Do to others as you would have them do to you, right? Would I want that person to do that to me? And if the answer is no, Jesus says, what would you want them to do? We'll do that instead. And it's, it's very, and, and recognize the positive statement of that was something absolutely new. It was absolutely new. It was not foreign to God's word. In other words, if you go into the Old Testament, you'll find the idea there. But the rabbis taught, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. So I can do that by doing nothing, right? In other words, if you say, 
don't hurt another person. I can lock myself in my house my whole life and keep that, correct? Jesus, on the other hand, is much more active due to others. I can't do that sitting on my couch. I've got to be engaged with people. And, and, and hear that. And we see that here. Don't repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You know, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. So there's a couple of other places where we're going to look at that, or at least pieces of that. Um, Proverbs 17, 13 is one of them. And I shouldn't have let Proverbs go quite so quick. Proverbs 17, 13. If a man pays back evil for good, evil will never leave his house. Ooh. That's pretty tough. Isn't it? Lord, forgive me for the times when I paid that evil for good, right? Um, and I don't know what yours says. I see it because I always print one of these, and mine, I may have corrected it before I printed them, but it's actually 1 Peter 2 19. Okay, so good. That was one that I actually caught before I discovered that I listed it wrong. Um, so 1 Peter 2, 19. So again, this now is the Apostle Peter. He says, for it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. So even if I am unjustly attacked and by God's grace, I choose to bless and I choose to be good in that situation, Peter says that is commendable to God, right? Um, you know, this whole idea of, of serving our enemies in love in verse 20 of Romans chapter 12, Paul is quoting here. And what he's quoting is from the Proverbs again. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will eat burning coals on his head. The actual proverb is, is almost word for word on that. Um, and then we're going to unpack that whole burning coals thing because that sounds painful, but it's actually something completely different. Um, Proverbs 24. Five, starting at verse 21, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will be burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Right? So, think about burning. We, we get the hungry and the thirsty piece, right? Think about burning coals. If I am going to be cooking in the first century, how am I doing it? I, I've got my brand new gas range, right? Not likely. What do I have? I have a cooking fire. Okay. Typically, they would make, you know, um, uh, stoves that actually could be inside the house out of Adobe or whatever. And, but you would have coals in there. And you would then have some sort of a way to cook on top of it. Okay. So sometimes you'd have a fire chamber and, and it would be separated by a little, you know, Adobe shelf that you could actually put stuff on to cook it um, in whatever you were using to cook. So what do you do if the fire goes out? You have to relight it. All right. So you run down to the local hardware store and get some matches or a Zippo. No, you don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not how you do it. Um, the stoves were designed where you could bank the coals so that even overnight they would stay, you know, burn long enough that in the morning you could add more fuel and now you've got your cooking fire going again. What happens if all your coals go out? You go to your neighbor to borrow some. 
And they literally had, you know, containers that they often would carry on their head. You know, why that made sense, I don't know, but it did to them. Okay. And they would go to their neighbor's house and they would say, my fire's gone out, can I have some coal? Keeping burning coals on the head is not just giving you a little, it's blessing you with much. Got it? That picture? So as a matter of fact, in ancient pagan cities, okay, not as uh, was not practiced this way among Jews, but in ancient pagan cities, your city government would have a large stove that was somewhere close to where the city government would meet, okay, that they would keep going all the time. So if as a citizen my fire went out, I could go get coals. Now here was the catch. In order to get coals from the city thing, I would have to take a little pinch of incense, toss it in the fire, and basically worship one of the local gods or goddesses, whatever the local deity that was in favor at that point in time, right? Now as a Christian, can I do that? I can't. So it's going to cut me off from that service. It's just one of those little curiosity things. But recognize that this burning coals thing, right, is really a blessing, not a curse. It's not like giving you a way to live, right? Even though you're treating me like an enemy, I am giving you a way to live. So um, ultimately then, um, as we think about this, the summary statement basically says, you know, um, do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, Jesus, this is actually a reflection of, of things that Jesus has said. Um, I am quite convinced that once Paul became a Christian, um, he found out about all the kind of things that Jesus had, had taught and said. And um, I'm sure some of these things may have influenced what he was writing. So we've got a couple parallel passages here. One is in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 5, all right, um, we we hear Jesus saying to us, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That would make sense to us as human beings, wouldn't it? But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven, because he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and on the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Um, and and actually, the the underlying Greek word for perfect means complete. So part of it. What is the big deal with Jesus about us loving our enemies? And if you think about that, there's a Romans answer to that. While we were still sinners, and a sinner is one who hates God and treats God as an enemy, correct? So ultimately, this love for enemies is forming us into the character of Christ. By the Holy Spirit's work, by the Holy Spirit's power. As, as a human being living in a broken world, has all the sin living inside of me, I don't have any love for my enemies. That only can come from outside of me. Right? And, and then I, by the Spirit's power, I'm given the choice to <laughs> do that way toward them. Or I follow my own flesh and do it the wrong way. That's the battle we do, 
Yes. So um, in Luke 6, it's a very similar expression, um, slightly, slightly different. Um, let's see here. Um, and again, the words of Jesus, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, be good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you, well, okay, we'll leave it at that. As he goes on and, and expands it quite a bit beyond that. Um, <clears throat> love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. That is a very different posture. And yet, do we not see Jesus doing this very thing? Right? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Well, slap you in the face and spit on you and everything. <laughs> and he is responding in love for them. Not me. So as, as we kind of begin here in chapter 12, this section of Romans um, that leads us down the road here to um, how do we live as God's people, right? What we're going to see through here now in some of the sections that are coming up, there's going to be more extensive conversations about a particular topic. But especially in chapter 12, we've seen just a whole variety of different, almost one liner kind of things. Or here's a, a few little statements about this. Here's how we live as God's people. So as we continue into this, um, Romans 13, um, and, and realize chapter and verse numbers are not in the original text, right? These were added later, primarily so that, hey, in Romans, Paul says, da, 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 da. so I don't have to page through the whole book of Romans looking for that. I now have a way to find it, right? Or if I'm writing about something that what Isaiah wrote, I can say, here's where it is. And somebody else can read that and go, okay, I can find that in Isaiah. I don't have to sit down and read the entire book and hope I don't miss it, right? Um, so this whole piece really, in many respects, even though we've got chapter and verse numbers breaking this up, this, this really flows from the previous, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, then what happens? Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, in bringing punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishments, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If re respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continual debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. 
So let us put aside deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Well, there's a couple things in there, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything stand out for you? Well, and, and they, they, um, ultimately, ultimately, in the history of mankind, anytime a new civilization arises. By definition, you are building that over and against something else, usually, right? Um, so ultimately, what, what is Paul prescribing here? You know, does he absolutely say one can never um, fight against injustice? I don't know that he's making that strong of a case. He is saying recognize that the governing authorities are there by God, right? So um, in the founding of any country, is there sin? Yep. Would this have been something that God would have initially said, that's sinful? Entirely possible, all right? Uh, that Declaration of Independence, you know, had significant consequences. There it was literally a war fought. And could have gone either way. British had won. All the people who were busy trying to forge a new nation here would have been dead. You know, they'd, just, they'd have all been hanged. So it, it, it's one of those where um, are there times in the in the in the course of of human interaction where one group of humans says we've got to go a different direction? That does happen. Did God command his people to overthrow governments? Jericho, Lystra, Derby. On it goes, right? So there are times when in the Old Testament, God causes governments to rise and fall, but recognize who's doing the leading. And so the real question in the founding of America was this genuinely a movement of the Holy Spirit, or was it a human movement that God then subsequently forgave and blessed? Or more likely, it's probably a combination. In the Old Testament, God will use pagan governments to accomplish his purposes. He calls Nebuchadnezzar, the leader of the Babylonians, the people who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, his servants. As we read Daniel, we recognize that there was a point where... God sent Nebuchadnezzar a dream to warn him, don't get, don't get too prideful, don't get cocky. And he did anyway, and he ends up wandering around out of his mind for a period of time, right? Living out in the wilds like an animal. And when he had the dream, Daniel came along and told him what the dream meant. <laughs> he did it anyway. Because one day he's standing there and says, look at this massive Babylon that I have built. And it's in that instance. God's on a rescue mission. Isn't he? he rescued Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, when he came back to his senses, declared once again his kingdom. Not for the first time, mind you, but declared once again his kingdom. This God of Daniel is the God of all gods and the of all the earth. Nobody's speaking against this God. 
Now, he didn't eliminate idolatry in Babylon. Never took that step, right? But recognize Assyria is called the rod of God's anger. So it, in one sense, we can say, yes, are we to submit to governing authorities? We are. Are there limits to that submission? And biblically, there are. Okay. We'll take a look at that as we as we kind of get into that. So, but that, you know, that question always shows up in my head when I read this. You know, was our country founded as a leading, you know, of the Holy Spirit? Or was it something else? And when you look at those founders, there were founders that were very Christian and very clear, you know, that they did not lightly take the actions that they did. There were lots of other actions along the way where they said, we need to leave from what's happening. Because what's happening is getting so burdensome that it literally will affect whether or not we can keep living or not, right? If all our money's got to go to England, then we starve to death. And, and in some cases, that was the reality of it, right? Um, because it's like, yeah, you got to pay for all this stuff. And hey, look, we have these colonists over here. Let's tax them. What the heck? <laughs> right? So a lot of different pieces. And, and I think in some respects, a deeper understanding of history allows us to wrestle with some of this. And unfortunately, a lot of our history has been significantly dumbed down. I mean, even the history we got in school, you look at most schools and, you know. Some, some did. Yeah. I mean, Patrick Henry was probably one of the most famous ones. Give me liberty or give me death, right? Um, or Nathan Hale, I should say. You know, they caught him and hung him pretty quick. So yeah, they were they were all wanted men by the British. Had the British captured them during the War of the Revolution, they would have they would have been sent back to England, tried and hung. There's just no doubt about that. You know, now you know. Uh, and, and of course, there was a certain level of risk because you had people like Ben Franklin who was over in France. Well, France and England were not exactly on speaking terms at that moment in time. <laughs> but the reality is you're sailing across the ocean, you know what I'm saying? And it was not uncommon for England to have spies in France and France to have spies in England. And, and sometimes if, they, if you tick somebody off too much who was one of these rulers, they would tell their spies to take them out, you know, and they would attempt to do so. Um, so, yeah, it, it was not, uh, you know, sometimes we get this fanciful little retelling of history that, oh, yeah, it was all just, you know, cherries and flowers and ice cream and uh, not even close. You know. <laughs> well, you know, it's and, and the thing is, is there were, um, you know, when Washington crossed the Potomac, recognized this was early in the war, his army was trapped against that river. And the Brits figured, well, we'll just wait till daylight, we'll go clean them up. Right? You don't want to fight at night. And that was not uncommon in that. There was, now, did they have lookouts? Absolutely. There was an unnatural, uncommon fog that descended over the Potomac, which allowed the entire army to escape. So they had a few people that stayed in the camp and kept the fires burning, so the spies would see the fires burning, and they were the last ones to leave. 
okay? So the reality is, is, you know, whose intervention was that? Hmm. I wonder who it is that controls the weather. I, so you, you look at all this stuff in, in, in whole and you kind of go, how does it all fit with God's word, right? Because he's not going to violate his word. So somewhere in there, you know, is this, was it sinful on the part of the United States to rebel against the governing authorities? According to Romans 13, it was. Well, let's go back and look at the governing authorities. Is God, in some respect, using this to punish them? Could have, could have been. I mean, once you read about good old, you know, was it King George III? You know, he was not actually, you know, if he was supposed to be God's representative on earth, he wasn't actually doing it well. <laughs> so, you know, and I, and I guess part of it, I really appreciated Pastor Goodell when he's praying for our nation, saying, Lord, help our leaders to follow Jesus. And if there's leaders that don't know Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, bring them to salvation. Right? I thought, that is exactly the prayer we <laughs> just be praying every day here, right? Because I look at some of our leaders and I'm going, the things you're saying and doing are absolutely contrary to what God says you should be saying and doing as a leader. Now, is it my job to uh, bring consequences on that leader? I don't have that authority. Is it my job maybe sometimes to speak out? Yes. Is it my job to pray? Absolutely. Absolutely. Told in scripture to pray for them, for my leaders, right? Even if they aren't good ones. Even if they're doing things God says don't do. So it, it, it's it's one of those things where, you know, part of my prayer today is that the elections would be peaceful. Regardless of how <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, that, that, that is the issue. We do in this country have the vote. If you live in China or Russia, uh, you also have a vote. It just doesn't mean anything. So, um, <laughs> you know, here it does. And I realize there's lots of questions on, you know, how some of this has been handled. But all things considered, uh, that's where we are. So um, we will uh, pick this up. We'll pick it up at about verse one here. Um, now, next week, I am in Kendallville. I'm just not here because I'm taking some staycation to work on my forever project at home. Um, so, <laughs> and I actually have a friend of mine who's coming in for a number of days next week who had said, hey, you let me know a time when it works, and I'll come in and help you. I don't know what I'm doing, but so it's like, it's great. I'm going to have help. <laughs> so I got to make hay while the sun shines, you know? Um, so uh, Pastor Rigdon will be here doing something. I don't know. We haven't really talked about what yet, um, but we'll pick this up then the week after that, Romans 13. So let me go back to... Oh. Here. It worries me what we can do with somebody in. If he's strong enough. If he's strong right. Enough. Yeah. Well, I, I can I can say with absolute certainty that every individual that gets elected is a sinner. <laughs> All right. There you go. Oh, that's a good one. I can say with absolute certainty that sinners will sometimes sin, right? So um, the real question as someone who is voting is for me to help, you know, to do my due diligence to understand who are these people, what values do they hold, you know, do they know Jesus as Lord and Savior? That's my first question, because if I can discern that, that at least, will they always do the right thing? Even in that case, no. But the reality is, if they don't know him, I know they're not going to do the right thing. By definition, right? So it's one of those things. 
And there are some key things that we can look at there, especially in our culture today. Where do they stand on the issue of life? Can you kill a baby all the way up until it takes its first breath? Can you kill a baby that's been inside mama for nine months but has not yet arrived? Or not? And the reality is, is I don't care how talented or good looking or compelling the person is, if they want to kill the baby all the way up to nine months, I'm not voting for it. Because I know what that is in God's eyes. And I don't want the innocent blood. I don't want to be participating in bringing the innocent blood on the land because I know sooner or later God consequences that. Right? So it's, you know, in, in, in one sense, it's kind of looking at some of those things and saying, well, and sometimes it's like, okay, I have two equally bad sinners. <laughs> what do I do? Lord, guide me. Right? I've, had, I've said that very many times in voting groups. You know, it's like, Lord, I'm really not sure which one of these individuals is worse. <laughs> so, you know, help me to make the choice that's pleasing in your sight. Right? Yeah, which is the left round two evils. Yeah, well, and sometimes it's like, you know, you got evil one and evil two, and it's really hard to tell, you know? Other times it's a little clearer. And sometimes you think it's clearer and you get that person elected and you find out, oh no, they really weren't who they said they were. Mm -hmm. You know? So it's it's an imperfect process, but it just, you know, we, we can go into the voting booth knowing you know, that anybody we vote for is a sinner. And I'm a sinner that's voting too, so I might get it wrong that way. So, you know. Yes. That strength of character. And and I think part of it is in some respects, I mean, you know, locally we don't have very contentious races going on here in northeast Indiana. Yes, sir. Well, I'm sure we did. Oh. Or 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 yeah. basically I think even in Indiana in general at this point, um, there are some, but probably not very many. Um, I know in my old stomping grounds there's a huge battle going on for district one. Which, you know, District 1 is like, if you have a D after your name, that's who gets elected. Doesn't matter who you are. They've elected some real winners. Um, but they have uh, uh, an African-American woman who's running for Congress in that district. It's just a woman that's sharp. She knows Jesus as her Lord and Savior. She's thought through the issues she has, you know, and, and the person she's running against is one of them, been there for a very long time, and, you know, doesn't really even care about what happens to the people of Gary. He doesn't have, he doesn't care about the people of Gary until it's election time. <laughs> then he cares about them for about 10 minutes. And as soon as he's reelected, see you later. Um, you know, so we'll have to see how that one goes. We'll have to see if, if the folks there have finally figured out this individual has done nothing for us and this woman actually might. Right. That's so so there that that's one race in the end that's pretty hot. Right now. So but the you know the reality is is this is why paying attention, what do these people say? How do they handle themselves? When you talk about strength of character, when people are pushed, how do they answer it? And I, it's it, it has been amazing to me to see some of these people running for political office who are just pleasant and calm and very, very firm. Because the press likes to play gotcha questions. Mm -hmm. There's a candidate out in Arizona. Her film crew comes with her. She says, these people are coming after me, so we're just going to film the interaction and put it out on the internet. <laughs> because what they do is they come and ask you a gotcha question. They never, they never air their question. They just air your answer, and then they spin it. She says, we're not going to let that happen. I'm just going to put it out online. <laughs> you know? This was the question. This was my answer. You can see the whole interaction. And it changes the whole meaning of what just happened, right? But see, that's somebody who can stand up for themselves. They, they, they're they're going to stand their ground, right or wrong, right? So it, I don't know. I, I, I have I remain 
hopeful for the country, but we'll see right. what happens. <laughs> um, we'll see what the Lord is, what the Lord has in mind here. <laughs> anyway, let's pray, shall we? Because we're way past our expiration date. Oh, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Here we go. Well, maybe it's Romans 13. I will be out in the next two Thursdays. Okay. Rick and I are doing some traveling, so we leave Thursday and then we won't get back till the following Saturday the 12th. Gotcha. Well, I I am Um no, Pastor Rigdon will be here. 